back to this issue of the profile that we were stumbling over last time. Uh, so what I'm showing here is a protein sequence written from the first to the 49th uh, letter and four proteins that are aligned to it. But very often you write the alignment the other way around. You're just written in, a, in, in this way. So say this is the query sequence, my guide sequence, my main sequence. This is a protein, a protein of interest. And then you would have three sequences of three proteins aligned to it. Aligned to it in this context essentially means a group. You imply with this alignment, with displaying the alignment like that, you always imply a grouping. You imply that this is what people call, call, call family or that these three sequences are above some similarity threshold that would allow you, for instance, homology-based inference. This is one way. So assuming that all three or four proteins have this similar structure and some aspects of function similar, then you can create this matrix. This matrix technically is one matrix with 20 amino acids times length of the protein. In this particular case here, 49. So it's 20 times 49 entries. For every single position, you have the probability, for instance, of observing the E at that position, or the V, or what, whatever residue you have a probability for that residue. Now you can write this profile in different ways. You could have a count. In a count way, you would essentially have a 25% or 0.25 for each of these four that you observe. Uh, the probability then sort of normalizes this count by what you expect by, by random or background, whatever your model for background is at that very point. Um, the difference between this position specific scoring matrix or profile and a blossom matrix is that the E at that position and the E, okay, E was a bad example, uh, the E at this position. <laughs> Uh, will have possibly, most likely, very different probabilities for, for instance, even having the E at that position. So let's see what that checks out this example. Oh, yes, the E yes. is 8 here and the first E is 4. Exactly, thank you. Uh, so there we have an example. So this would, in a, in a blossom matrix, those E's would have the same value. It would still be 49 times 20, but there would only be essentially 20 different numbers of it, 20 by 20 different numbers. Well, here really is the entire matrix. Okay, that is what I refer to as a profile. Uh, now to subset localization problem, but we already have that. I believe I'm, uh, I, I'm sorry, there is a mistake in the way we start. Uh, we did talk about homology based inference, didn't we? Uh, so we were stuck. We stopped. Did we talk about the localization? The text analysis story, we talked about that too, no? The keyword analysis? Okay. Uh, so we can infer subset localization through homology based inference. So we have a similarity between two proteins, a sequence similarity between two proteins, let it be written by a sim between a query and a protein of experimentally known that is higher than some threshold theta. And if that is higher than I infer, knowing E, measuring that Q and E have similar sequence, I infer that Q has the same subset organization as E. Okay, now here is a different idea that uh, comes from Rajesh Nair, who is now at the FDA, the Food and Drug. Uh, agency in, 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 and it started with a Swissprot record. So Uniprot uh, is the database of all known protein sequences or well, uh, well annotated protein sequences that we know more than so Uniprot currently has about does anybody know how many entries are in Uniprot? Ballpark? Ballpark is good. Yeah? Ron? Shoot. How many? Uniprot. Yes, Uniprot. I know there are few. Somebody? No idea? That's the point. Swissprot is curated. So Uniprot is essentially, again, I said all protein sequences is not quite, not quite, quite right. But how many protein sequences do we know? Ballpark. Throw, throw some number at me. And don't say 20,000. Human have about 20,000. 200,000. Or is it? You th so, but all of these are sort of limited databases. Everything that we know, 
Throw a number at me. Nobody has an idea? Six million. Okay. Ten. Ron gives ten. Who gives less or more? What, what, what do you got? <laughs> <laughs> ten? <laughs> ten probably is that what you really believe? Anyway. Um, Actually, I no. Let's not get into that. Um, and anyway, we are in a, in a, in a assume you had a SwissProt record such as this one. Somewhere there's a keyword subset localization or location, and that one says nuclear. Assume somebody removed that keyword. For instance, the annotator had not put the keyword there. So you want to develop a method that predicts subset localization. You read that SwissProt record, but you don't find the keyword, right? That, that is one way. Can we not, from whatever else is in here, infer that the protein is nuclear? For this particular case, I mean, you, uh, this is obvious. Can, can some, I mean, you are an expert enough to say a few things, yes? Involved in DNA replication? Yes, DNA replication. Uh, I mean, transcription activator. Uh, there's a bunch of statements in here, uh, uh, cell cycle. So there's a bunch of, of, of statements here that suggest, yes? But then you, I mean, then you'd have to rely on that the functions are completely empty, like all of them, and also... We will get to that point. That's a very important point. Uh, possibly not, Verena. So in this, for this particular case here, uh, Paul picked one, one, uh, two words. Uh, I picked a few others. Transcription factor are two words that are sufficient to sort of guess this most likely is a nuclear protein already, right? Uh, and this does not mean complete annotation. So it could be very sketchy, and for very sketchy annotations you could possibly already get some evidence that this may be a nuclear protein. Maybe more sketchy things together would help you, yes? Uh, even the binding to RB1 could be sufficient if you look at RB1 and find out that this one. But that could be transporting, right? So that yeah, could be... Transported out. Uh, uh, so this could be a transporting type of protein that binds to a protein that is important. So, again, uh, ultimately the question simply is, can we use these records, even given that these records are absolutely not complete? And that will be an, 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 a particular point in that method. Now today, you would not actually, on that note, use these keywords anymore. So there's a code today that you will look up. Uh, and the code reveals that something is explicitly, experimentally measured. Uh, and has a, a code number that is now introduced into SwissProt. But again, um, how would you do that? So let's, let's first define what the goals of the method are. Goals of the web methods are. First of all, uh, for some of these uh, association here, it's absolutely clear what the subset localization is that is implied if you are the expert. Blood coagulation, chromatin regulator, DNA binding, those are kind of things you guys would know, but there are most likely other things for which you could not make the map. And certainly, machines couldn't make the map unless you teach it, right? So we want to recognize trivial associations. And we also want to recognize non-obvious associations. Examples where one keyword is not enough, where we need sort of a, uh, a mixture between many keywords. And what you have to begin with, of course, is you have to begin with a set of proteins for which you know the subset of localization. In this particular case, for that work from Rajesh, there was uh, 15,000 then. Uh, and then we extracted the keywords from all of these columns. Yeah? <laughs> Just there to ask. Uh, and then you can sort of find correlations uh, and can, can sort of do. Uh, text analysis, what you see is for most cases you have a lot, a few, at most cases you have a f relatively few keywords. So of the, of the important ones that we use, you see for the majority of cases we have fewer than 15. For some we have, have many more. Uh, and this is sort of the blue is precision, the red is recall, uh, according to number of keywords. So the more keywords you have, the more precision goes up and then there is sort of a strange signal in between. That's noise, we don't have error bars in here. Uh, but the, the recall, so this is, this is wrong. Uh, 
uh, there's something wrong here, the recoil curve. I cannot explain what, there's something is very wrong. Uh, it is as if I swap the labels. There's something wrong in this curve. Most likely the counts here, yeah, that is most likely was wrong. So if we made error bars, you see that we have so few counts from something like, I don't know, 13 or so onwards. So until here, coverage goes up and it should go down uh, and precision goes down. So blue and red is switched. That's obvious, right? So the more keywords, the higher the precision and the fewer cases you find. So that's why blue must be uh, recall, red must be precision, and this curve makes no sense after the coverage goes down here. Sorry for the confusing plot, yes? Why does accuracy go down on 30 keywords? So that's what I'm saying. So ultimately, ignore everything up after this point because we don't have an error bar in here. Uh, because essentially the counts are so small that is ultimately the, the explanation for, for this. Uh, but now my question is a different one. So this is a, an accuracy, uh, uh, this is a precision recoil curve or could be an accuracy curve or whatever it is, uh, for the first hit. So you simply take the one that has the best match to the vector in the, key, uh, in the database, right? You take the one. If you take if you ask yourself, how well would you do if you take the second best, right? Then you would see this one. And what I'm showing here again is precision versus uh, recall. In this particular case, I do not know whether I switch the labels and I trust the labels. Let's just say the top hit is the blue and the top two hits is the red. The red is above the blue. It's higher. So the red is better. Question is, is that true? So that's the crucial point. Compare it to random. And then you will get clearly the answer that you, in some sense, answered uh, emotionally, uh, Ron. Uh, the answer, what, how many to put, how, for how many of the top hits are you better than random? And then if it's for many, then really we are back to the question, uh, how many can they handle? But for one and two, that may be OK. But, but then the question, in this particular case, the answer was no. This is not better than random. So taking the second hit, in fact, it did not help at all. <laughs> because we don't quite know why, possibly because often they were the same. And we clearly did not try your, your algorithm that I believe would be a very different one to look for consistency. That's a great idea. Uh, I cannot remember. I, we clearly did not put that into the paper. Uh, so there were some tricky correlations discovered here uh, that were not necessarily sort of known by experts. When we sort of run this thing for Swishbot, uh, we see that this particular method here is in fact for many cases able to predict subcellular localization where you cannot do it otherwise. So you cannot do homology-based inference. You do not have the record to look up. But you can actually make a, a, a prediction only with this method for this bunch of uh, five different organisms here. Uh, and for those five different organisms, you see that actually is a substantial number of proteins. So uh, I cannot remember what the total number of proteins is. Yes, 100,000 roughly. Uh, so for one-fifth, only this method made a prediction, which is a substantial amount, right? It's not the kind of thing that rarely ever happens. Um, here is the, the story again for, for Swishbot. So the red one is the ones where, where you can only do it with a lock key. Uh, substantial fraction again. Now, then you would sort of look at an entire organism. Uh, I showed some of that in the table. Uh, and then the contribution of lock tree still is, is very impress impressive compared to other methods. So let's talk about uh, localization motives. I'm out of sync. Uh, we did not talk about lo localization motives at all. Okay. Um, so there are two types, of, two generic type of motives. One is what is called sequential, meaning a motive is defined as a uh, regular expression type of thing, right? Touches our topic for ah. <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> Sorry. Um, so uh, what I mean by the sequential one is from, from the sequence you can recognize the motive. The structural motive is one of the type where say what you require is KK. KK here and RR here or something like that or RK. The probability of having KK and RK is very high so that motive is not meaningful but on the three-dimensional structure they come together and suddenly together on the structure you see positively charged four positively charged residues give you a cluster of positively charged residues that's a so-called conformational motif so the difference is really the first one you can see from knowing the sequence alone the second one you need to know structure for okay so in nature essentially we distinguish different paths of localization. Uh, so the major path, simply because it's the longest, uh, path is the one that goes to secretion, to extracellular space ultimately, where proteins are targeted through the endoplasmic reticulum, Golgi apparatus, lysosome, endosome, secretory vesicles, uh, uh, to the membrane, and some of them are really secreted then. Then there's an uh, a, a passage to the nucleus back and forth. We will talk about that in a little bit more detail. We, they have talked about nuclearization signals, right? Yeah. Uh, so we will not talk in more detail about that. Uh, and so then there, there's uh, yet other pathways. Uh, in some sense this is sort of the main one. Uh, the secretary pathway. And that brings us to the word of signal peptides, uh, originally coming from uh, Gunnar van Heine who is one of the, the, the big people in bioinformatics, uh, also was on the Nobel Prize Committee. Uh, he actually announcing the Nobel Prize of 2008 uh, in chemistry. Now, he coined a bunch of early papers. Uh, he has worked a lot on membrane proteins, a lot of groundbreaking work on membrane proteins, signal peptides, the way proteins are in fact uh, pushed through membranes. Just a quick mention, we haven't touched nuclear organization. Signals at all? Yes, just. I, mean, I lost completely touch. I mean, we today in the during the exercise, but not in the, 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 the ah, exercise. Ah, that's sort of mean. Yeah. Just because you <laughs> think that you were Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Um, uh, and the other person on this, on this, uh, in this work is Sam Brunach, uh, another big person in the field of computational biology. And the third one is Henrik Nielsen. And the major thing of Henrik was really to build the database. So simply to collect a lot of signal peptides. Now what are signal peptides? Signal peptides are signals, motives, at the begin of a protein that lead, that are recognized and that lead to the protein being secreted, put into the secretory pathway is what that means. Not necessarily put to the extracellular space, but put in the direction of extracellular space. Okay? Uh, and what Henrik essentially did here is to align, as, or to collect as many experimental data as possible, refine from SwissProt, so the, the curator data in this particular case was not clean enough and not complete enough, so he did, redid the job and built a database. And once he had a database, he began to classify. And one level of classification is on this sort of descriptive level. On the descriptive level, you say signal peptides are internal at the beginning of the protein. Uh, they're typically 15 to 30 residues long. They are cleaved during translocation across the membrane. Not always, but most of them. They exist in all three kingdoms of life. And they have a relatively simple architecture. The architecture word means here uh, there's an N region, an H region, a C region, and a cleavage site. N region means essentially there's a, a region at the beginning that often has uh, positively, ch positive, positively charged residues. Then comes this region that has a lot of hydrophobic residues. It typically is longer than six residues. Very often is as long as a membrane helix. Uh, and very much looks like a membrane helix. And in fact, mem many membrane helix prediction methods confuse with these signal peptide H region. Uh, then there's a the C region here is a polar and uncharged, and then comes the cleavage side. How would you figure that out? So I give you 3,000 or 2,000. I can't. I believe 1,400 was his initial data set. One thought. 1,400 signal peptides. How would you figure that out? Yes? I mean, just look at the amino acids. 
for 1,400, and then you read them, and then you sort of I mean, you come acids. more likely with a headache than with a with a result. Yeah, yeah, but you can group amino acids. I mean, you have polar amino acids, you have your amino acids, you have your uncharged amino acids. So what do you look at? Be careful. We cannot do a multiple sequence alignment because actually they are not sequence similar. So we have 1,400 signal peptides. We cannot align them. So the typical motive thing, and how would you align them? So they have different lengths. They are 15 to 30. In fact, what I ignore here is, 50, is, is more 15 to 50. Uh, so the, there's immense spread. But we don't know where the regions are. Correct. Okay. You don't even know they exist. Okay. okay. Well, when you start this work, you don't know any of that. Right. Yeah? Uh -huh. right. When we start, we, we don't know that it's n terminal. My question is, well, n terminal you immediately see, right? You, you look at the you look at the thing. You have a starting point. You have a localization. Okay, this the first bullet point. Fair enough, trivial one. But this architecture was my question. How do you sort of get that architecture out of your data? You cannot sequence align them, so alignment will not do. do. And it's not that easy to gaze at these regions because they have fairly variable variable length. What would you do? How would you align them? Let's begin there. That doesn't work. Why not? Oh, because the sequence identity is too, 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 too low. Right. No, we assume that we have a local... Ah, so you, you force an alignment method such as BLAST to do an alignment when it says I cannot do the alignment. Tricky bit. Tricky bit. Could work. But very, very difficult. It's very unlikely. So the question is the register, yes? I mean, you could just replace the amino acids with their chemical properties, kind of, and then see. That's one way of doing it. That's a great way of doing it. But the simplest way would be to look at the letter plot, which sort of a letter plot, where you sort of the height of the letter is proportional to the question: What is the register? But how would you generate what? a letter plot? If the registers are not, so that's why you need the register. Yeah. What in this story here gives you the register? What sort of the natural register? What's the the natural way of? So what I mean by register is you have to have a point where you compare these things, right? You cannot compare them from the first residue on, because for some cases the hydrophobic region here is at starts at region 20, and for others at region 10. How do you line them? If you force them to align, then you would see, uh, in some cases, let's say blue is hydrophobic, in some cases they are like this, so they wouldn't align. There would be no consistent signal, simply because they have different lengths. But what is the un... There, there, I, I, I claim that there is a point in this story here that is unmutable, or that is length independent, in some sense. Yeah? Well, you could, I don't, I don't know, but you could look, have a look at the cleavage side. Where That's the point. That's the... So. Immutable point. They are cleaved. Okay? That gives you some clear evidence. Okay? That gives you one thing to put up to, and this is in fact what these plots look at here. That's the first level of plots. So these minus numbers are downstream of the cleavage side. And upstream of the cleavage side. So immediately the cleavage side signal. Uh, comes to you. Those are three different uh, types: eukaryotes, uh, gram-negative bacteria, gram-positive bacteria. Yes. And you kind of lucky because we have three classes. You could do beginning, downstream from the cleavage side, and then everything in the middle between these two. So the point is, when you begin this way, you sort of narrow it down. You're right. So you could also start from the beginning, but the point, the moment you start from, from, from this reality, sort of you approach different ways of doing it. So you to get the most important point first out. You see that there's a cleavage signal, and you see that there's a region here that is sort of somehow next to the cleavage signal. Yes? structures of transport proteins Oh, at this very point we had very few of those. So when uh, Henrik did his first data set, again, he collected 1400 sequences. Very few of those we had a 3D structure for. In fact, they are very difficult to crystallize. Most people, when they determine the structure of a secreted protein, they will cut out the signal peptide first. Because, again, remember that uh, protein structure, at least in those days, cost a million. Today, it costs $100,000 on average. And a protein, say, has 200 residues. 
and 50 is the cleavage side. So the, if cutting out the cleavage side would save you $25,000, right? And you know that the cleavage side essentially is not relevant for most proteins because it's just to transport that thing. The real thing why you study the secreted protein is you want to know how it attacks uh, other, other creatures. Uh, or what, how it binds other creatures. So you want to know its effect, right? And that is the domain that does not have a cleavage side. So that is the cut one, right? So you put most of the money into what you want to know most. And, and signal peptides are very difficult to do. For instance, the hydrophobic, the membrane helix is, is, is one of the, the problems there. Uh, in fact, in some cases, that is a membrane helix. So for some, some of these secreted proteins, the signal peptide is not cut but it's put, it's inserted as a membrane helix in the, in the membrane and the protein is essentially anchored in the membrane. But anyway, so this, this is sort of the first simple step uh, and then you begin to sort of uh, refine it from there. So you look at the other side, as Paul really said, at the beginning again, you see some signals at the beginning and then you sort of can find the hydrophobic region in between. Uh, going from both ends. Um, and then you can, once you have all of this in place, once you know that this is the case, then of course the question is why not do machine learning? And in fact that's what they did as the next step. Uh, initially they did neural networks uh, and then they sort of used a hidden Markov model because hidden Markov models are completely tuned to this idea of a grammar. Uh, there is a lot of additional sort of single peptides and there are tons of other methods uh, and there's sort of a recent version uh, 2019 that uses deep learning uh, signal peptide version 5 uh, and as you somehow can sort of gaze from the architecture this has a already a relatively high level of complexity so I mentioned that some signal peptides look like membrane helices uh, and uh, so some methods, uh, just the, base, the, the take home messages here, there are some methods that predict membrane helices that do 90% uh, mistakes uh, in terms of signal peptides. So they predict essentially all the signal or most of the signal peptides incorrectly as membrane helices. So this is one way. There are some sort of more modern methods that do much better uh, here, but typically they do better because they sort of have another module that does signal peptide prediction in, inside of it. Um, but the confusion remember, uh, remains a point. Here are two examples that sort of do signal peptide prediction and membrane prediction together and that is the way they do better. Um, so other signal peptides, there are transit peptides, target peptides. It's sort of the same thing except for this is for chloroplast and this is for mitochondria and they look a little bit different in terms of detail. So you cannot use this prediction method to find those. But in terms of architecture, they have a hydrophobic region, they have a polar region, they, the, the mechanism, the biological mechanism is similar. And I've got uh, the, the original authors here to uh, have a method that uses them all three, so they are methods that predict for each of these and then sort of combined. But target P somehow did not really survive. Um, there's a bunch of other approaches. Here is one example where we look at the other end of the story. That's a re so-called retention motive. Retention motive uh, and a C terminal and here are two examples for retention in the endoplasmic reticulum and Golgi. So these are proteins at the beginning they have a signal peptide meaning that is for the secretory pathway and at the other end they have a retention signal and that means if you have that you stay on the way to the uh, on the secretory pathway, on the way outside, you are trapped in the ER or you are trapped in the Golgi if you have those retention motifs. But you do see that, first of all, there are not many proteins that have these signals and you also see, if I give you much more time, that these signals are not very accurate. So most of these signals, in fact, match to many, many uh, proteins that are not Golgi, not ER. And ultimately, our assumption in Verena in this particular case would be that these motifs are the conformational type. So we would have to know the 3D structure of these cases. For those proteins, we know the 3D structures because that is not cut off. 
uh, for some of those. But still, at this point, the retention motif is not a well-defined thing. We don't, simply don't know enough. But here is one story that is simple. That's the story of nuclear localization signals. And nuclear localization signals largely is a case such as this one. The way it works is you have a protein with a nuclear localization signal a protein here importing and transporting that bind to this nuclearization signal put your protein I mean the importing plus NLS is pushed through the nuclear pore uh, into the nucleus and so when we started this work the database of motifs ProSide had one of these motifs available and that motif had a precision of 90% and a recall of 3% um, so we felt this is not good enough and began to do exactly curator. We collected uh, nuclear localization signals. And here are some. And Murat Chokol did that. Uh, so the thing that immediately jumps at your eye is that there's a lot of red. Red means positively charged residues. Uh, in some cases here, the most extreme cases, you have cl clusters or a little bit of red that are sort of spaced somehow. And then there are cases here that are most likely not completely uh, the correct. Here are some spacers, here are regular expressions really. Uh, so you have a bunch of these motifs that you find experimentalists involved in the protein being nuclear. Uh, and some of these are fairly long. How would you check whether they make sense? So you find a paper, experimentalist says that is the nuclear localization signal. The definition of nuclearization signal is you take that signal, put it onto another protein, and that protein will become nuclear, even if it's not a nuclear protein. Okay? And in the most extreme case, you can actually really do that. You can take a nuclear localization signal, uh, somebody has done that experiment, put it on a piece of gold, and the gold gets into the nucleus. Really works. Perfectly. Uh, but how can you find out that the motifs that are there, that the stretches of sequence, I mean, you could do the experiment, but we cannot. So we have a bunch of mo mo motifs here. How could you check in the computer whether they make sense or not? What would you do? So I give you a bunch of, or you collect from the literature a bunch of these motifs, uh, all of these, and then you want to check whether they make sense, yes? Uh, check, check the subsidiary localization. So the first thing is you, you build a data set of proteins for which you know the subset localization and check whether they are nuclear. For all the ones that are, for these, uh, all the proteins that you match are nuclear. That's one question. What else do you need to ask? So let's just, oops, I do that. Um, so let's just present the idea here uh, so you have a bunch of proteins that you know are nuclear you have a bunch of proteins that you know are not nuclear in yellow uh, and you absolutely want that the nuclear localization signals are nuclear only meaning they are only here and not here and there's an additional thing uh, you want to find a protein that actually has that signal and not only one Right? Because this idea of nuclear localization signal is not that you do homology-based inference. We can do that already. We want to find, how would you sort of exclude that you do homology-based inference? How would you test your data whether it's doing homology-based inference? I mean, if somebody puts in, so in some of these cases, uh, some of these publications had motives, nuclear localization signals, that were 150 residues long. That protein is nuclear, that is the sequence of the protein, so is the signal. True. But not quite. So how can you distinguish whether the motive that you have is doing homology-based inference or more than that? What's a simple way of, of a simple criterion for this? The idea really is you sort of group it into families, and you say if you match only one family with that, then that's homology-based inference. I could have done that with uh, homology-based inference because every member in this family I can pick up, a, if I know one, this is the subset localization for one of them, I can pick up all the others. I don't need a nuclear localization signal. But if the signal is such that it matches in two different families, then I cannot use it for homology-based inference because I cannot infer between families, yes? Or if it's not consistent within a family, wouldn't it? That is another interesting idea. Uh, but let's, 
yes, that would be another another point. If it's not consistent in the family, but in, not consistent in the family. The problem with that one is I know that subset localization family is defined as when. So I showed you the threshold for subset localization. Inference is not 100 percent, right? You have 90 something percent, so you have 10 percent losses anyway. Uh, so this is a, more, is a bit more tricky. But what would you do in order to refine the motives? So say you do know, you, let's say we trust every single experimental data point. We know they did an experiment, they know it's nuclear. We just say it's not quite the right region. They did not have enough money to sort of really nail it down. They, uh, so what can you say if you hit proteins that are not nuclear? What's wrong with the motif? How will you change the motive? Say you have a motive, you believe somehow uh, this motive is right, but this motive you find hits non-nuclear proteins. What would you do to the motive? What, yeah? Well, maybe it's too small to generate. It's too small. So you would, you would try to make it a little bit longer. Okay? So in this particular Harnt story here, for instance, most likely that is too short. So you would simply look at the protein and a refinement of that would be not looking at the protein, but the alignment of the protein, and go in the direction in which you somehow bless you, in, in which you somehow see a conservation of a sequence, and you would ex ex exactly extend the signal such that the family would still match, or something like that. And you would do that until you no longer match here. What is the problem if it matches somebody else now? What's the problem if it matches only one family? It's too specific. So how can you change that? By making it shorter. Right? And again, by making it shorter, you may match, you know, now may fall into the non-nuclear story again. So in changing this, you have to watch out that you would, so our criterion of changes, so we went through this in many cycles, was to, to match at least two nuclear families and to not match a single non-nuclear protein. And with that, uh, we could sort of build a data set of 214 signals that had 100% precision and match sort of 40% uh, roughly at the time of all the non-nuclear proteins. And that essentially was work done in a few months. So by just reading a lot of literature. Um, and it could do a lot of new predictions. Now here's an interesting story. So when you go back and map the nuclear localization signal onto a structure. On one of these structures, we see this one. What jumps to your eye? So, this is the nuclear localization signal. Ultimately, the story is a wonderful cycle. You have a nuclear localization signal that binds to importing the proteins imported into the nucleus. In the nucleus, many protein bind to DNA. The importing goes off. And the same signal from which it goes off, so the protein binds to that signal, goes off, the signal is free, it binds DNA, it does its thing with DNA, DNA goes off, X protein goes, the same signal is used to export the protein. It's a perfect cycle. So you have a nuclear localization signal. This one here is called a nuclear export signal, but essentially it's the same signal in this particular case, the same amino acids. And these same amino acids are also used for DNA binding, yes? This is not always the case. So there are some subset of signals for which this is the case. So this does not capture all DNA binding motives, not at all. Uh, and it certainly does not capture all import and export signals. Yes, they differ. But there are some cases where, where this cycle absolutely works. Yeah? And I guess it makes just sense and practical yeah. that you have the same signal which you For some bind. proteins for that bind, exactly. Yeah. Okay, so then it's cleaved from the protein? No, that's not cleaved. Oh, that's another thing that I believe I did not make clear. Uh, the NLS is not at any given, so not only do the lengths differ, also if you look at the relative position for the signal in the protein, there's absolutely no constant. They are completely spread out over the protein. Right, so, but then how, how so there's a signal bound to importing and protein or is the NLS the entire protein with an NLS? No, the idea is that the NLS the signal. Uh, that is, so the blue thing is the protein with a nuclear localization signal. Oh, so it is just a protein that is being imported 
and then it does something with DNA and then it's exported again. Exactly. And it does the something with the DNA. So uh, the, the import it moves away, but leaves this signal o open here. This this sort of part that I sort of indicate with a key. Yeah. And the key is binding DNA. This is what this is supposed but to be. There's mean. still much more protein around, which yes. does something with the DNA. Because again, in many of these cases here, uh, going back to the, these are proteins of several hundred residues and uh, ten, 10 residues involved in the nucleation cycle. So it's a tiny fraction. Okay. Well, then, then it doesn't make a lot of sense because if you're importing it into the nucleus, you're probably going to have just something to do with DNA. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But again, so this is, is, is a subset, is the minority of all nuclear localization signals. Uh, but there are some for which this is a perfect cycle that happens. Uh, and the same signal also is an export signal. Yes. So it's one signal that does import, export, and DNA. For some signals that is the case, yes. It's a per perfect mechanism. Uh, so now if we sort of annotate for Swiss prod, you see that uh, experimental homology, uh, that's experimental, that's homology, that's the keyword. The NLS you can actually not even see in this one because it's relatively few signals that we can find. And that gets us into the story of uh, de novo prediction. Uh, and that gets us back to this slide, um, which is ultimately the idea. Günter Blobel got the Nobel Prize for the idea that proteins are sort of moved through the cell through zip codes. Uh, and the signal peptide is one zip code, the nuclear localization signal is another zip code, the ER and Golgi retention signals are other zip codes. Okay? The reality, however, is that most signals at this point are still not known. Now, that could be that a lot of signals remain to be discovered. This slide here I did for the first time 20 years ago. Uh, and the reality has not changed. But you know, if you wait 20 years and there are a lot of experiments, you begin to believe a little bit less. Yes, there may still be a lot of signals to be discovered, but, but what is happening over the last 20 years in terms of signals discovered is not that much. Uh, so fivefold uh, the number of signals have, have increased, but uh, the absence is still amazing. Uh, or it could be other types of motives. It could be this type of motive. It could be the motive that we, for which we know, need to know the three-dimensional structure. We still do not know enough three-dimensional structures to really have discovered that. So this part that you initially suggested, Verena, is something that is still not understood well enough in, uh, on a level of other than individual cases. For some cases, this sort of level is understood. But for the larger case of, of transport, it's not. What I mean by the larger case of transport, learn from it to predict for hundreds of proteins. On that level, this one is all understood. Yes? I have quite a specific question, so please excuse me. 